Hello there, welcome to Showcase. Christie's considers itself as a bridge between different cultures. And now the auction house has opened one of the largest ever exhibitions of Middle Eastern art in the UK. It's called Formative Radiation, and it's by Lebanese artist Samia Oseran Jumblat. The piece is among 150 works on show at Christie's London that pay tribute to the past and present of Middle Eastern art. I think the artists in general are windows into a reality, cultural reality, social reality, so they represent what they are seeing. So a lot of them were seeing or are still seeing the Middle East. So in a lot of artworks, what you see, you see the description of society, the description of their feelings, and you see some somehow, sometimes, often you see their background also, their cultural background. So the Middle Eastern art is recognizable by the signs of what their identity is. And a second exhibition honors one of the greats of Middle Eastern art, Hassan Sherif. The Emirati lived and worked in Dubai until his death in 2016. He was a pioneer of conceptual art and known for his work with a variety of materials. Hassan Sharif is one of the most exceptional artists of the Arab world. He brought conceptual art to the UAE and also to the Gulf and was avant-garde and really reinvented the conceptual arts in, in the Arab world. He was extremely impactful because he was also a leading figure, a mentor, uh, an unbelievable artist who witnesses also the transformations of the UAE when the UAE became a union. Mumni says since Christie's serves as a bridge between different geographies, the exhibition comes at a good time when so many people from around the world are flocking to the city. And maybe some possible buyers will pay a visit too, as 30 of the works will go up for sale later this year, and they are likely to be highly sought since, over the years, Middle Eastern art has broadened from being a regional appeal to a worldwide market. Women in Islamic societies are often perceived as voiceless and invisible. But an exhibition that claims the opposite has opened at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Female artists from the Middle East are defining who they really are and how to empower women worldwide. Women Defining Women in Contemporary Art of the Middle East and Beyond is an exhibition that depicts both the personal and universal stories of women in Islamic societies. The aim is to challenge stereotypes about this part of the world. Because so many people think that all women are the same in Middle Eastern lands, they're all oppressed, they are invisible, they have horrible lives. I mean, I hear this when I come back from visits to the Middle East, and it's not true. It's like women everywhere. They have a, a, have a good deal of agency and they act upon it. And one of the things this exhibition will demonstrate through the women's imagery is how much agency they have and how much more agency they would, they would like to have. The 75 works presented at LACMA are by women artists who were either born or live in Islamic societies, but most of the works come from Iran. They were made before the recent uprisings in the country, which were triggered by the death of young Mahsa Amini in police custody. And they demonstrate the long history of women fighting for their rights. There's a large video projection by Nusha Tavakolian of a woman who's just standing still while the wind uh, blows around her and you see plastic bags and leaves and she's standing still. This is, this is again before the recent uprising in Iran but it, it emphasizes the resilience and strength of Iranian women, as do some of the images by Shirin Ali Abadi, like the girl blowing the giant bubble gum. It's kind of like, I'm in charge. Women living in Western societies usually assume that they're better off than their counterparts in the Middle East. But curator Linda Komarov argues that with the ongoing fight over abortion rights in the United States, the exhibition is timely. American women have been complacent. It's easy for them to look to another country or another region and say, we're better off than they are, but maybe we're not. Maybe we're all in the same boat together. 
These powerful narratives that express personal and more importantly universal concerns will remain on display until September 24th. Zoe Saldana is back with a new TV series. Although she has starred in multiple film franchises, the actor admits she at first rejected the new role because she felt intimidated. You have no family. Laisla de Oliveira plays Cruz, who goes undercover in a secret female spy program called Lioness. She befriends women whose partners have ties to terror organizations. Cruz is a recruit of CIA operative Joe, the lead character played by Zoe Saldana. She's your field agent. Do what you think's best. The actor admits when Taylor Sheridan, the creator of Special Ops Lioness, approached her for the role, she first had to turn it down even though she loved the script. Neutralize the target. I have ADD and I'm dyslexic, so learning a lot of dialogue was always a very daunting thing and I never... I never thought that I would ever get to be a part of, you know, films where the dialogue and the writing is the most important, you know, character in the whole story. And I tend to run away from that. I speak two languages. I think in all these different languages. I, I have a hard time focusing, which is why um, the genre of action was always very appealing to me because I can be active. But um, I never thought I had, I had that in me. A year after rejecting the role, Saldana found herself thinking about it and decided to challenge herself. Lucky her, the part was still available. Also, the film's star-studded cast that includes Nicole Kidman and Morgan Freeman were a huge plus for her. But I worked really hard. I, I um. You know, I, I, I rehearsed, I knew my lines to all the episodes as they were coming in weeks, months before we even shot them. I really wanted to, I, I wanted to challenge myself. I wanted to see if I had it in me to be a part of something great and, and to, to deliver uh, something that I'm proud of. And so far, I'm really proud of the work that I've done. And it seems critics are also impressed with her performance. And judging by their comments, so is most of the audience. Special Ops Lioness is available on Paramount+. Plus. How do we shut this down? Last year, Johnny Depp made more than $3.5 million when he released his debut art collection, Friends and Heroes. This time, the Hollywood star is back at the art world with a self-portrait depicting himself in between court cases related to his former marriage. Johnny Depp has etched his emotions of recent years into a self-portrait and has put up the result for sale as a time-limited edition. The actor began working on the piece titled Five around 2021 in the midst of an explosive dispute with his ex-wife Amber Heard, which played out in courtrooms on both sides of the Atlantic. Johnny still has many, many fans out there, but I'm also hoping that art buyers will see it as a you know, one-off work of art. It is a portrait by a guy who was an artist before he was a musician, and he was a musician before he was, he was an actor. Art for Johnny has always been very, very special. It's always been very, very personal. He's painted and drawn his entire life. And I think that art connoisseurs will see that. Depp says the self-portrait was created at a time that was a bit dark, a bit confusing. I thought it needed something else. It Using archival pigment in the style of his earlier series of portraits, Five marks the first time Depp has sought to capture his own image. Five is a smaller artwork with a lower price tag. It's described as deliberately intimate and shows the actor in a state of emotional exhaustion. He wanted to make you know, his self-portrait smaller than all the friends and heroes that he's done before. Uh, and also he wanted to try and make it as affordable as possible. So previous releases uh, that have sold out instantly have been £3,950. Now this is 
950 pounds. So it's, it's smaller, uh, but it's half the price. Uh, but still, the same amount of work has gone into it. The self-portrait is a time-limited edition on sale for just 13 days. And for Depp, the biggest reason why he's sharing his piece publicly is to begin the act of creative healing. This supporting life marked the future debut of Lindsay Anderson and paved the way for him to become one of the most influential directors in cinema. But as Alijan explains in our movie Almanac, this 1963 picture also provides a complex insight into the British class system. This is a man, and what a man. A man of violent contrasts. A man greater than ordinary men in his strength and in his love. Frank is a coal miner who's not content with his life. As a man filled with anger, he tries to find a reason to live. And along the way, he finds himself recruited to the local rugby team. He was an idol. Critics received the picture as a bold look at class struggle and singled it out for having the observant eye of a documentary. And that is right on the mark. Since director Lindsay Anderson previously made short documentaries, no need to feel the movie is part of a bigger wave of features known as kitchen sink dramas. They are often distinguished by male protagonists who are angry with their place in society. And these films mostly project their frustration with the hierarchy. Savagely embittered by life, she returned his love with a burning, passionate hate. Despite being packed with such force and critical acclaim, this sporting life was a flop back in the day. You got a lock on that. It'll be all right. And the rank organization, the company that released it, said they would no longer foray into kitchen sink territory. Some argue the film's poor box office performance also killed the enthusiasm of local producers to back any such British films. But this sporting life's legacy lives on. The Guardian believes the movie is a great working-class hero tale, even claiming it delivered a blast of energy to the dull early 1960s. And contemporary UK filmmakers counted as an influence. That comes to show that despite its initial poor performance, the ideas and style that made this sporting life still resonates with today's cultural zeitgeist. They all laugh at you, they all point you out, don't you know that? Trying to be different. And they point me out too, Andy and Ann Linda. We're not proper people now because of you. No other film has ever brought life to the screen with such brutal honesty. This sporting life brings you face to face with people it compels you to love. Filmmaker Mark Cousins is known for his out-of-the-box style. The subject of his latest documentary is none other than Alfred Hitchcock. And as expected, Cousins approaches the whole matter in his own unconventional way. Yes, Mr. Hitchcock, it's working. Okay. I'm ready to tell my story. It's Alfred Hitchcock. And before I die, I was the most famous filmmaker in the world. In My Name is Alfred Hitchcock, Hitch guides us through the themes found in his works. And how would you like us to look at your films in the 21st century, Alfred? Of course it's not the real Hitchcock whose voice we hear. And the words are not his. It's scripted by Mark Cousins. And it's simply the narrative used by the Irish filmmaker. Yes. In Vertigo, I wanted you to feel the force. I wanted Kim to hypnotize you. But I also wanted you to run away. Escapism. Like Kim. The documentary is divided into chapters. And the first one, titled Escape, for example, argues that cinema is a means to take a holiday from life. And Hitch would know this quite well, because he himself once said, some films are slices of life, mine are slices of cake. Well, now we'll have to do to you what we did to the Mendoza's, to find out the names. 
names of all the others. The late director even shares trade secrets. As if to justify his renowned thrilling pacing, he says if a character is in a hurry, then the scene must be played out slowly. The Irish Times thinks Cousins' movie provides an insightful, eccentric commentary from beyond the grave. The article also says Cousins is the story of film had a similar sense of eccentricity. The Odyssey series is an almost thousand minutes long survey of cinema since its birth. Although some took issue with his talkative analysis, the production was received as engaging. As for the narrative of his new documentary, fictional or not, creating some kind of dialogue with the director is not new for Cousins. His fan-favorite TV series, Scene by Scene, had actors ranging from Steve Martin to Lauren Bacall break down bits from their movies while watching it with cousins. And in this one, the conversation he creates with Hitchcock gets the pass grade from critics. Although, they still warn that only a movie buff as passionate as Cousins could get away with such a narrative involving the master of suspense. But given his famous left field style, his fans wouldn't have it any other way. Everyone's had their say about your movies. For now, at last, it's my turn to take you on a guided tour of my movies, my stories peek into my world. Over to you, Mr. Hitchcock. The Salt Cathedral of Sipakira in Colombia is a hotspot for both tourists and Catholic pilgrims. But what makes it unique is that it's built with an assault mine around 200 meters underground. And a recent video mapping show inside its tunnels left visitors with even greater fascination. El mapping son reflectores de última tecnología. Video mapping is made up of state-of-the-art projectors that seek to represent a light show in the dark, 590 feet underground. The light shines and the light is seen more clearly. That is why video mapping is an additional attraction for our country's first wonder. Today we will inaugurate the complete project, which features the projection of stained glass windows from the world's best and most important cathedrals and basilicas. This was a very cool presentation. It was something different. It captures the attention of people. The combination of the images with sound was very cool. The Venice Biennale of Architecture is being held for the 18th time. And for the first time since the international event began back in 1980, it's curated by an African with a major focus on Africa and its diaspora. This is Leslie Loco's The Laboratory of the Future. Loco, the curator of this year's Venice Biennale of Architecture, gives a platform to voices that have long been silenced. As the first ever African curator of the event, she chose to feature a selection with a bulk of work by Africans and the African diaspora. So actually in the process of designing the participants, designing the structure, I purposefully closed out the rest of the world and thought, okay, think about the story that you want to tell. Once that story was out there, then it was available for the participants to respond to, and it's that interplay between what I wanted to say and what they want to say that eventually becomes the story that everybody else sees. 
So, 89 participants, including famous names such as David Ajay and Theaster Gates, responded Loco's story by working on the themes of decolonization and decarbonization. The black body was Europe's first unit of energy. We have had a relationship to resources since time immemorial. We operate at a place where resources are not stable. They are also often fragile. They're often exploited. Our relationship to them is exploitative. I think we have a lot to say about this conversation. Loco has also aimed to reduce the carbon footprint. She encouraged the participating architects, artists and designers to be as paper thin as possible with their exhibits, resulting in more drawings, films and projections, as well as the reuse of materials from last year's Contemporary Art Biennale. And here at the US Pavilion, Chicago-based African-American artist and designer Norman Teague has upcycled plastics from everyday items such as laundry detergent bottles while thinking of how to cope with plastics durability. A lot of my work has been thinking about Africa and, and the ways of bringing out the language uh, to bring uh, Africa the continent and Africa African-Americans closer to one another. Um, and so language as well as um, aesthetic. Decolonization is a natural theme at the Brazilian Pavilion, where the architectural heritage of indigenous and African Brazilians are shown. In a many different ways, the whole pavilion is a decolonial gesture. It's a decolonial gesture in the way that we are challenging certain hegemonic narratives uh, embodying the capital and the modern capital, Brasilia. Uh, it's a decolonial gesture in the way that at this room we are showing heritage of Afro-Brazilian indigenous peoples and acknowledging uh, their contribution to Brazilian architecture. The Guardian calls the 18th International Architecture Exhibition an important challenge to Western architectural tradition, while New York Times acclaims it's the most ambitious and pointedly political biennale in years. So it's a great chance to absorb art and architecture that highlights African work by many underrepresented artists. And the biennale runs until 26th of November. Professional and new artists are gearing up for another summer exhibition of the Royal Academy of Arts in London. More than 1,600 works are displayed this year at what is the world's biggest open submission exhibit. The Royal Academy of Arts summer exhibition has been around since 1769, when it was launched to raise funds. The event brings together all kinds of art, from prints and paintings to photography, sculptures and even architectural models. Each edition is coordinated by an Academy member. This time, it's painter David Renfrey's turn. His chosen theme is Only Connect. It's loosely based on a short quote from E.M. Forster's Howard's End, and it's his pledge against the divide he sees among people. We are in an age of unprecedented ability to communicate with each other, um, and yet we're more fractured than in my lifetime, uh, globally, I, I think that we need to come together. My ambition was to make this summer exhibition the reverse of the, the outer disconnect, if you know what I mean. It's a bit ponderous way of putting it, but um, I wanted it to be a very uh, a show which embraced everybody. This year, the judging panel had to sift through 16,500 entries to pick the final contestants. It was not an easy task. It's hard work. You go, you get home at night, you can't even see. You've seen so many images in a day. You, you, it's horrible, th that side of it. But, but the process, um, it's exciting. You, you really want to find good stuff. and hang it on the wall. The artworks are presented in a total of 11 galleries, and each can cost anywhere from 50 to hundreds of thousands of dollars. There is something for everyone. 
you're bound to find something you love at the summer exhibition because there's so much of it. In terms of this year, it just feels like it's quite a fun vibe. It's like really bright and colourful, lots of interesting artworks. It doesn't seem too heavy in tone as some previous ones have felt. And I wonder whether that's what we want from a summer exhibition, just to keep it quite lively and quite interesting. The summer exhibition opens on June 13th and runs until August 20th. That's it for this episode of Showcase. I'm Esther Adjurist from me and the whole team here in Istanbul. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.